it's really important you get politicians to come out and support you and stand with you in this. I'm very proud to do that, to be with you this morning and to support you through this campaign, both as MP from here, from the Shadow Cabinet, and as running as leader of the Labour Party. My leadership, if I win, will be standing with you and other campaigns like you so we can win on issues like this that are so important. Those are the words of one Keir Starmer. That was during his leadership campaign. He is, of course, now leader of the Labour Party. Two years later, Shadow Cabinet members are banned from backing strikes or going on picket lines. He said that on a UCU picket line. So, some dishonesty there when it comes to Labour's current approach to strikes, trade unions. But is it necessary if the Labour Party want to get into government? That is our topic for this evening. And I have a stellar panel lined up for it. I'm hoping it's going to be fiery. Joined by Mick Lynch, General Secretary of the RMT. You will recognise him from all over the news channels, completely owning um, anyone who dared interview him. Um, <laughs> I'm also joined by John McTernan, political secretary for Tony Blair um, when he was prime minister. And I'm joined by Zara Sultana, MP for Coventry South, um, who since first getting elected in 2019 has become one of the most high profile left wingers in parliament. So to begin, um, I actually don't want to start on the question we have advertised tonight, should Labour back strikes? I want to start on some breaking news from this week, um, from yesterday, which is the comments Quasi Kwarteng made yesterday when he was giving his mini budget. So Quasi Kwarteng said this, At such a critical time for our economy, it is simply unacceptable that strike action is disrupting so many lives. Other European countries have minimum service levels to stop militant trade unions closing down transport networks during strikes, so we will do the same. And we will go further. We will legislate to require unions to put pay offers to a member vote to ensure strikes can only be called once negotiations have genuinely broken down. Now, because I feel like Kwasi Kwarteng was potentially talking directly to you um, when he said that in Parliament, I wanted to get your response um, to what Kwasi Kwarteng said there. Well, I think he's out of touch. He uh, betrays very little knowledge of the way industrial relations work, the way the employers approach negotiations and the way we approach them. As it happens, my union runs referendum ballots, referenda, referendums, whatever it is these days, all of the time. I think we put three on last week based on settlements. But we've got the right to judge when a, an offer is, is mature, if you like, in a negotiation process, whether that's in a dispute or whether it's just in a regular cycle of negotiations, which we do all of the time with many companies, or, or whether it's at the end of a, a, a fractious dispute like we've got on the railways at the moment. So last week, stagecoach in the South, uh, first uh, Southwestern buses had a referendum. It was rejected and we're taking action uh, along with all the other members in the coming weeks. So we use referendums as a way to, to, to consult the members, but we also have other means of consulting people. So on the network rail dispute, which Shaps has been banging on about where this, a lot of this comes from, we have a, a Friday afternoon Zoom meeting with between three and 600 shop stewards, as they're called in most unions, reps, as they're called in my union, who represent maybe 50 people in a depot or maybe two or 300 people in other depots. They know exactly what the mood of their members is working around the clock on the railway and they report back very vigorously, I've got to tell you, if anyone thinks that RMT activists do not tell RMT officials exactly where they stand at any point in the dispute, whether it's formulating a dispute in the middle of it as we are now trying to find a way through or at the end of it and indeed in the post-mortem as always happens in the union movement, they just don't realise how vibrant trade unions are and how democratic from top to bottom our union is. And our union is really proud of what we do. We've always elected uh, our officers. All of our, electors, our officers can be put in and thrown out through, through the ballot paper. And most of our settlements, when they're controversial, i.e. they've got strings attached, will be put to a referendum anyway. That is the standard technique. But look how stupid this is going to be. If I'm an employer, I go to Mick Lynch or John McTernan, how about 1.95%? And he goes, that's not good enough. He said, but I'm making an offer under this legislation. So we have a referendum, we reject it as you would. And he go, next week I'll offer you 1.96. You can do another referendum then. Or he puts another minor change. Now, I've never heard an employer say that to me. They've asked, will you be recommending it? Will you put it to a referendum? And we tell them across the table, yes or no. 
We're totally honest with the, the negotiators. We don't pull any tricks. They were upset that we didn't do that. But I can tell you now, if that had gone to a referendum, it would have been chucked out eight, nine or ten to one, possibly more. And Shaps would have had more egg on his face than he had, he had anyway. And uh, the way he disposed himself during this debate caused him to lose his job because he's completely out of touch with the railway and the way that working, the working class movement works, which has always been democratic, even inside the political side of it and the trade union side of it. We are the greatest bastion of democracy in this country. What they're saying is everything's going to be deregulated. The entire society, the entire economy, health and safety protections are going to go out the window. The only thing that is going to be more regulated is the relationship between trade unions and their members. We don't need it and we're going to have to fight it. We decide our own democratic way forward through our own structures. And I know we're going to have a lot of disagreement on the panel tonight when it comes to the Labour Party and trade unions. I want to know, do you agree with Mick on this question, John and Zara? Absolutely. Yeah. It's a ridiculous policy. Um, I think it, I'm not sure it'll get through the House of Lords in its form, in the form that they want it to come through, and it should be immediately reversed by an incoming Labour government. Okay, so we're on the same page on that. Um, the, the broad church. There we go. Um, I do want to, now we're getting on to the, the, the debate proper, should Labour back strikes. I want to go to you again, Mick, because I think this is kind of the key question to kick this off, which is, do you <coughs> care if the Labour leadership back RMT strikes? Do you care if Shadow Cabinet do or don't turn up to picket lines? Does it, does it bother you? Does it bother your members? I would like them to have the freedom to support a picket line if they want to. Look, the Labour Party is sometimes the employer in councils all across the country. Going back through our history, the, the Labour Party has been the employer when my union and other unions have had massive disputes. So obviously, in the railway strikes in the 70s and the 80s, uh, and on other occasions, you wouldn't expect them to come out. We had a massive dust up with Ken Livingstone when he was the Mayor of London and the RMT because he was running the tube. So you've got to be realistic about it. But I don't think Ken Livingstone ever lost touch with his values. We had a, we had a falling out like you do in any broad church or family. So I'm not bothered whether Keir Starmer turns up or not. What I'm worried about, and I'm really worried about this, and this is genuine, if, if John may not believe me, I want Starmer to be elected because that's in the interest of our class. And this is a class problem. We either have that lot we've got now or a new lot. Whether I like everything they say or not is another matter. But we need the Labour Party to be elected. He's not going to achieve that unless he identifies with what working people are going through now. Some working people are involved in strikes. Some working people are unorganised, which is why we need new trade union and workers' rights legislation from a new government. He's got to show that he's in complete empathy and sympathy and synchronisation with them, that he understands and can express their needs uh, and their requirements through legislation and just through empathy and showing that he supports them. I'm not bothered if he turns up. He won't be at the negotiating table, and nor would chaps. I've got to do that with the employer, but the employer can be unshackled by the new transport secretary. So, yes, he's got to identify with what we're going through. Whether he's on a particular picket line is a matter for the, the period of time that we find ourselves in. There's been Labour politicians who had no problems with turning up on picket lines, and Starmer has done it himself. He's too careful, is my main criticism. He's too cautious. He's got to be bold. If he was as bold as they've shown, the Tories, in the last two days, on our behalf, I reckon he'd be 20 points ahead rather than struggling to achieve maybe 10 or 12 at the moment. So, yeah, I want him to support us. I want him to be in line with us so that we can all support him and get him elected into, as, as Prime Minister. So Mick said this should be about the choice, the choice for MPs or Shadow Cabinet members to go and join picket lines. You're a backbencher, Zara, but have, have you been under any pressure not to turn up to picket lines? How, what's, the, what's the culture, I suppose, when it comes to the Parliamentary Labour Party when it, in terms of should MPs support strikes or not? The pressure is on front bench MPs, people who have a shadow cabinet position, people who are PPSs, and as a backbench MP, I have way more freedom. But that doesn't mean that the environment isn't hostile or tense towards supporting um, industrial action and going to picket lines. And I think um, the Labour Party should 
honour its history as a party that was founded by trade unions to represent and be the political representation of workers and the trade union movement. And I feel like at this moment in time, there is that juncture and there is that debate, and it shouldn't be a debate, as a, a party that is in opposition when we have the greatest assault on living standards and workers are not getting paid enough to pay the bills, there shouldn't be a question of whether Labour MPs go or don't go on picket lines. They should. Um, and that's something that I do and socialist campaign of group of MPs do as well. So, John, I want your take on this. I think you, you recently said it's, it's the Labour Party, it's not the strike party. <laughs> Um, so why do you think that Keir Starmer, frontbenchers, I don't know your position on backbenchers, but why do you think the Labour Party should be very careful um, about backing strikes? The Labour Party was created by the Labour movement for a purpose. That purpose was to form governments and to legislate. That is the key element of the Labour Party and the difference with the union movement. It's not our job to be involved in backing sides in disputes. Disputes are between employers and employees, between businesses, management uh, and trade unions. Where there are trade unions organised and having been a union member all my life, uh, of ASDO, a uh, union member all my career, um, I support the, the growth of unions and it's been one of the tragedies of my life to see union membership fall and any new form of organisation that helps union members organise in any way we can go into areas where under unionised, that, that's great and, and legislation should help that. And I wish we, I wish there'd been a partnership that was deeper between the unions and myself when I was political secretary. But to win an election, you need to win the country. Uh, the sad truth at the moment is the, the majority of, of workers aren't members of unions. Within those people who are members of unions, the majority of members of, 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 of union members have never been on strike. And within that, the majority of union members who've taken industrial action have never been on a picket line. So it's a tiny, tiny proportion of people who've ever in the labour movement ever been on a picket line, and particularly now when there is hardly any strikes and there, and there, and there are far fewer union members than have ever been in, in, in the history of, 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 the, of, of our movement. The situation is we have to win people who do not naturally think of themselves as wanting to support the Labour Party, to support the Labour Party to get a government. If we don't win the centre ground, we won't form a government and we can have as many uh, disputes internally about whether we should join a picket line or not join a picket line. If we're not in a government, there will be that ridiculous regulation that a, that a manager could can, can just say, I'm going to make you a formal offer and you're going to have to put it to your members, even though they know and you know it'll be rejected. The point is to build and not to alienate the broadest base possible to win a Labour government, which has to uh, have a record swing towards it and a record gain of seats to form a to form a majority government and form a majority only of one. And so it's just the wrong thing, it's the wrong it's the wrong thing to do at the wrong time when we do have a, a lead. I agree that we should be absolutely clear about what a Labour government would do, and that's what this week is about. Why will a Labour government make your life different? But I don't believe that Labour saying what we'll do is allow the shadow front bench to go to a picket line will make any difference. The danger is it will alienate some centrist voters who are thinking of ditching the Tories and coming to Labour. Yeah, but John, yeah. Look, it was a mistake to put his blanket ban and issue it as a diktat because you know that so many uh, Labour MPs would be struggling with that. So he's walked into a trap set by the, the media, I think, of broadcasting that he's got a ban and it sets up this silly... Uh, debate amongst people who should be friends about whether they are going to be on a picket line or not, when he's already done it. He did it. He's on the record. He's on film. I know, but Keir, Keir's politics are Keir's politics, and Keir's history as an MP are Keir's history as an MP, and I know that, Keir, that, 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 that Keir comes from the left of the party. He doesn't come from my part of the party. He comes from the left of the party. Um, but it is, it's clear to him, as the leader, it's clear to me, uh, as, a, as a former senior advisor in the party, the Labour Party got defined into a particular place in 2017 and 2019 under Jeremy Corbyn's leadership. And the place we got defined into is a place from which we could never win a majority at a general election. And there are many ways in which I think we can draw from the, the, the period of, of, of Jeremy as leader and particularly the ideas generated and the energy around Navarre, the energy around a whole load of bits of associated, the world transformed. 
those are good things that have been drawn on. The reason that we're a broad church is that, by and large, pragmatic, centrist Labour leaders take energy from the left and deliver a government that's a great reforming government, whether Attlee's or Blair's. But getting to be the government is the key. And the definition of the Labour Party in people's eyes has to be one where we are seen to be the most reasonable people involved in, in the thing. And so Keir is saying we need to be outside the dispute. And you've said Labour's employers always have fights with unions. That's why we set up pay review bodies. That's why, you know, I, I, I agree with you. Grant Shapps should not uh, should not have been involved in the discussions. It's for you uh, uh, and the management and, and the railways to sort out the efficiencies that will fund the pay rise and do the deal that is good for your members and good for the ultimately the travelling public, the customer who the service is for. Do you worry, Mick, that if there were? Labour front benches, Angela Rayner say. I imagine if there wasn't a ban, I can imagine Angela Rayner, very high profile going on a picket line. Do you, does it worry that you think maybe the Conservative strategists, that's exactly what they want? They want a picture of, of Angela Rayner in front of you guys on the picket line outside Euston Station? I don't worry about it because I don't think it's going to happen. So I only worry about things that might happen. So she's going to adhere to the ban, I should imagine, because she wants to be a person of influence in the party. So that's what she's going to do. Look, I'm not stuck on this issue. A lot of people think that general secretaries sit around <laughs> worrying about whether this particular personality from the front bench or the middle benches or wherever is going to turn up. Because we know when we come off the picket line, we've got to go in and negotiate in a really tough environment. It's not going to change the dispute. I just think the ban itself, publicising it so uh, broadly and making it such a sort of red line has given himself a bit of a problem because his own members who want to put it, I'm talking about members of the PLP, are going to balk at that and it's going to feel like an unnecessary imposition and it's going to look like a diktat from Murdoch and the Mail and the Telegraph. That's what it looks like to everyone, that he's just triangulating against a group of people that will never support us. And if you, if you do that, you end up giving them paying more stuff forward to the right wing. That's the problem. If he wants to steer a path that makes, it says, I'm not uh, in hock to the trade unions, I'm not in ha hock to factions, fine, I get that. But why do such a peculiar thing as saying you're banned from expressing yourself on a picket line? I think it's because the RMT was on the picket line, personally, <laughs> but there you go. Zara, what's your analysis of what's going on in the Labour Party? Do you, do you accept the line that Keir Starmer and his people are probably supportive of the strike, they're supportive of the, the demands being made by RMT workers, but they've made the pragmatic decision that it's it's not worth the bad press. What we should do is is keep um, our, our position, you know, unclear uh, to try and win a general election. The, the other option is they, they don't back the strikes by the RMT and they think that the demands are unreasonable and they have actually no interest in, in supporting strikes, even if they didn't think they were going to get attacked. So do you think this is them being strategic and then or you might disagree that it is strategic but do you think this is them being tactical to try and win a general election or do you think Keir Starmer and the people around him just don't really like strikes and trade unions very much? So it's no secret that me and Keir aren't from the same faction of the party and we have different views on things but I don't think that he is against trade unions organising and winning pay rises for their members and better terms and conditions. I do think that there is the caution that Mick was referring to, that you just wait, you see what focus groups and polling say. And actually, I just wanted to come back on a point that John was saying. After, uh, during the RMT strikes, polling had 58% support. The public supported the RMT's industrial action. And it was uh, due to the work of Mick and others in the RMT going to the media and talking and breaking down the bullshit, essentially. So I think there is caution, but I think there's also um, not wanting to look like they're in bed with the trade unions, which is how it's framed by the right wing. So it's about appeasing Murdoch and others. And it boils down to the fact that the billionaires, the bosses, they already have a party. They have the Conservative Party. They've already picked their side. They're engaging in class war. And we saw that with the mini budget that Kwasi Kwarteng presented. And workers need that representation and someone to have their back. And that's what the Labour Party should be doing. So I think it's a mixture of caution, but also not wanting to fight or rock the boat and just let the Tories kind of fuck up essentially and then pick up the pieces but that's not enough to get people out on the doors to vote uh, well out to the polling stations to vote for the Labour Party you need to present a vision and John said you know 2017 2019 needs to be looked in a particular way when 2019 uh, 2017 the Labour Party came very close to winning um, and that was because of of us 
presenting a manifesto that addressed the real issues affecting the country. 2019 was very different, but I don't think we can dismiss the 2017 election um, and, and what Jeremy and, and that manifesto meant to people whose living standards were under attack and are worse now. I suppose if asking the question, why was the 2019 performance bad? Probably very, very low down on the list comes at front benches supported strikes, I suppose. Jo John, I want your, your take on, on that polling. Actually, if Keir Starmer wants to be popular and do popular things, he no, should support no, no, strikes, could... which are popular right now. Yeah, that, that, that's a, that, that goes to the heart of what's the purpose. The purpose of the political wing of the Labour movement is to win elections. The purpose of the uh, industrial wing is to win industrial struggles. Uh, and the Labour government's place is to take away unfair burdens on workers and their, and their organisation, their unions, their representatives, so there can be a, a, a fair battle between ca capital and Labour. And we know that we need to do more when we come into government around that, and Keir's committed to, to a whole range of things around that. But my view is that those figures that um, the, Zara was, the, the polls that I was talking about um, are a reflection of mixed talent as a leader, uh, people's view of the case he's making, people's view of the case, the failed case that the, the, the government ministers are making on behalf of the industry. And I don't think um, you can borrow, I don't think the Labour Party, Labour leadership can borrow the popularity of a union in one particular dispute by being on a picket line. Um, it doesn't make us more popular just to be on the picket line. It's, it, it takes us from the centrality of offering a vision for the country to siding. The Labour Party, when it governs, is going to govern for business and for workers. It doesn't govern only for one side of the country. It governs for every part, for North and South, for, for, for North London as well, South London, for Scotland. And so we can't, you, you have to be in that sense. You stand back from it. You have peer review bodies where the employer, uh, you try and make the, the level playing field for the, for the workers. And I, don't, I think just because it's popular, we can't go and borrow that popularity. We have to er, earn the popularity we need to, to form a government. Um, I want to move on from the precise question of who does and doesn't turn up, up to strikes and move on to sort of a broader question about pay and the current struggle we're in. Because one critique um, sort of I've made of, of, of Keir Starmer, and uh, I think it is slightly different to the do you turn up to the strikes mm -hmm. or not, is that essentially the government at the moment have said everyone in Britain should be getting a real terms pay cut. Mm -hmm. They've said we cannot afford for people to have pay increases that match inflation. And that is saying everyone blanket should get a pay cut. Labour haven't staked out a position on that. When, when Labour MPs are asked or Labour front benches are asked, should people have pay rises that match inflation? I, I, I don't think I've ever heard one say yes. Right. So, well, I think you probably heard Zara say that. Sorry, front benches. Front benches <laughs> or Keir Starmer and his shadow cabinet. Yeah. <laughs> so do, do you think they've missed a trick there? Do you think on pay and on the current moment we find ourselves in, they haven't been clear that they stand on the side of workers and people don't deserve a pay cut? It's not for the Labour Party to settle every pay settlement in the country. It can't be. When we're employers, we have pay review bodies. And when, and when we aren't employers, we're not employers. Everybody who's a worker uh, understands 85% of people in Britain work in the private sector. They don't work in the public sector. Uh, the, pro the, the prosperity, continued prosperity of that business uh, is the thing that guarantees them work in the future. Um, so everybody knows that pay negotiations and pay settlements inside organisations uh, are a matter of coming to of coming to a, coming to a number. The Labour Party doesn't know how to come to that number. We're not a centrally planned organisation. We're not a central planning organisation. We're not going to say the pay rise should be like this. The inflation that and that's being caused by some external factors and some factors caused by this government it means that everybody's living standards are falling more dramatically than they've been falling in the last decade. But we've got falling living standards because we're living in an economy that's not growing. And our economy's not growing because in 2010, 2011, the Tory party strangled the economy. There was a recovery of one and a half percent growth, which they'd love now, that Alistair Darling left, and they killed that with austerity. So we're living in the consequences of a liberal, a liberal uh, coalition with the, with the Tories and the consequential votes on Brexit. But the Labour Party can't say we've got a view on people's pay rises. We, we're not intervening in that. That's not actually like, for Labour Party. It's for workers and, it's for, and where the union is for unions and where, where it's public sector is for pay review bodies. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's not a question that's ours to answer. The peculiar thing is, hmm. where we do deal with private sector employers, many unions are getting deals that are, are acceptable. Hmm. And hmm. you put them under a bit of pressure because they can't withstand uh, the loss of revenue, if you want to put it simply. So the ironic thing is the private sector employers are in many cases, not all cases, there are, there are exceptions to that, of course, 
coming up with some deals. It's where the Tories are running the, the show in the railway, mm. but in the health service and all, all sorts of other areas where there's going to be massive uh, disruption. Uh, there's there's going to be real pay problems. Now, the problem, some of what John says I'm in sympathy with, but where you haven't got the Balancing Act, and in the 70s, uh, Labour struggled with this continuously when they were in government, how do you uh, balance the needs of business and have uh, pay control and price control. And that's the way they tried to do it, balance one off another. So we'll give you uh, even price control mm -hmm. and benefits control and all sorts of added value that the government can put in to rebalance some of the loss in wages because free collective bargaining was limited in those days. But the Labour Party's not in a position to do that because they're in opposition. So they can empathise, is the difference, John, with, with what workers are going through. And I don't think Keir Starmer's job would be to go, go into right. I'm going into the Royal Mail, there's a multi-billionaire oligarch running it, and I think the settlement should be 7.75%. That's clearly, clearly not his job. What he could do is say, the problem with the Royal Mail is that these bastards, the Liberal Democrats, Clay, uh, not Clegg, what was his name? Cable. Cable. Everybody loved him, he was lovely and cuddly, if you remember. Privatised the Royal Mail, and this is causing all the problems in that sector. They could be saying that the health service workers have got an unfunded pay increase, which is gonna cause massive cuts to clinical care going forward. The teachers are gonna get an unfunded pay settlement. Now he could be saying mm -hmm. stuff like that, that people will say, well, he's on our side. Mm -hmm. But what we get, and forgive me for this, this clinical robotic, careful response from people like Rachel Reeves. I watched her last night and I thought, I don't know what she said. I don't know what she said in response to one of the most dramatic budgets some of us have seen, some of us have been around a long time. You think, oh, this is going to be a good budget, and it turns out to be really, really boring. You have to read through it over the next three days. But when Kwarteng stood up there, he was making a declaration of class war. Yeah. The rich are going to get richer, and the rest of you are going to be knackered. Everyone under £155,000 unbelievable, even trade union general secretaries don't earn that much, is going to be poorer and everyone above it is going to be richer. Now, why is Rachel Reeves and Keir Starmer not on the telly, frothing at the mouth, saying stuff that working people are going, go on, give it some, give it some. They're just not there, John. That's the problem. It's not about whether they come to the negotiating ta table saying, I'm with Mick, you know, Go on, Mick, give it to him. I'm with uh, Dave Ward. Go on, Dave, give it plenty. That's not what we want. What working people want to hear is that there is a party that's with them, that's with them when they're struggling to pay these bills, worried, must be absolutely cacking themselves, to use an old term, about how they're going to pay their rent this winter, how they're going to pay their mortgages, whether these uh, leaseholders on the right to buy schemes one of the biggest national scandals in our history, are going to foreclose on them and start selling mm -hmm. off their properties, which I'm hearing people in my own life are experiencing at the minute. That's where they want to see the passion, that we're going to promise to rebalance this society and redistribute wealth through all the mechanisms, some of them subtle mechanisms over time in the course of a government, and some of them very direct in the first uh, days and weeks of a government. That's what they should be saying now. When we get in, we're going to be as bold and radical as they've been in the last two days on behalf of their class, uh, on behalf of our people. And he doesn't even have to use the word class. Ordinary working men and women, I think the term the is these days. The working class boy has done well. Exactly, but he's got to be a bit more strident. Otherwise he's not gonna win. That's the problem. Zara, how hopeful are you about Keir Starmer in government? You know, they are ahead in the polls. Um, it, probably he is odds on, I think, to be the next prime minister. So was Kinnock. How, yeah, I mean, if, don't count your chickens, let's say. But how pro-worker, how pro-trade union do you think Keir Starmer would be as Prime Minister? And Keir Starmer's not going to want you to say this, but how much influence do you think you and the Socialist Campaign Group could have if there is a slim majority in Westminster after the next general election? Maybe it does make sense to keep your powder dry until there is a 10-seat majority and then you can really, you know, I you hold the key no, cards in there. So I can get into politics to play games and to play 4D chess and whatnot, to think what will happen in X amount of time. And this is what influence one of us can have. Um, it's about the here and now and people are suffering and they're terrified about the decisions that they have to make. 
uh, a Keir Starmer government will be a bloody good thing for working people up and down this country and that's what I work for. That's what I do, do knock all the time in Coventry South for to get that Labour government. Do I want um, a, a pro-worker government? Of course I do, but I haven't heard the kind of things that I want to hear from Keir about reversing the anti-trade union legis legislation that even Tony Blair didn't reverse. All of these things that Thatcher has left in her legacy, which you know Liz Truss is, is hoping to kind of um, build further foundations on, those are all the things that we need to reverse the privatisation in, in the NHS. And even when I hear about um, the current front bench position being like, oh, we're actually quite comfortable with the private sector in our health care service that makes me deeply distressed and uncomfortable so I think there's a lot more that we need to do in terms of our own policy positions but of course a Labour government regardless of you know you know which which faction that leader comes from is is better than a Tory party that is literally about enriching the richest in our society and battering working class people even more. John, I want your take on Labour in government obviously you were an advisor to Labour in government the, the premise of don't support strikes now so you can get into government later is based on a Labour government will be better for workers and hopefully not just a bit better, but, you know, fundamentally good for workers. And there are a lot of disputes between the trade unions and, and Tony Blair during that era. I think at the no, start of this, really. there weren't really. you, you said at the start of this discussion that there was you, you, you almost wish you had a closer relationship with the trade unions. What, what do you think about Tony Blair and that new Labour government, the last government, obviously, their relationship to trade unions and workers' rights and pay? Well, we extended workers' rights uh, every year that we were every year that Tony what was in power. We, we extended that. We extended them, and the things we the things and we should be clear about a few things. Um, I believe, like Tony, that passion without power is ultimately pointless. But I also agree with Mick that passion and emotion can be part of empathy. And without empathy, there's no point in being a political leader either. Because mm. if there's not an empathetic relationship between you and your voters, whether it's, it's your members or it's your voters in your constituency, or without that understanding and human link and human bond, I mean, it's kind of it's desiccated, you know, desiccated kind of politics. I, Labour, Tony had a very strong relationship with the trade unions, trade unions um, from the beginning to the end. There were no, there were no, I can't think of a, of a the biggest dispute we ever had was the fuel, the fuel duty, uh, the, uh, the fuel, the fuel uh, strike, and that was the independent lorry drivers who, who took, a, who organised the first of the kind of modern network campaigns. They were organised on mobile phones, texting each other. And when Tony went, like, who do I negotiate with? Everybody goes, well, there is no, there's no leader. It's a, it's a, it's an absolutely decentralised uh, movement. Um, there was a, there, the. the the, the, the things that we did were, by and large, you know, we, we, um, we extended maternity rights, we extended maternity pay, we extended adoption pay. We did, we did a lot of things that were based around equality in the, in the workforce. And a lot of things we did were actually focused on workers who were not unionised. Um, and that was a reflection of the weakness of the unions. We should, we should, we should probably, in my view, in retrospect, looking back on it, we should have seen that we should have, if we had built more protections into the rights of unions to organize and to enter workplace and to have ballots to get recognition, that would have been a good, better recognition of the shift between capital and labor that was going on. It in, made it in really difficult to get recognized. I have to deal with that legislation all the time, going um, through the Central Arbitration Committee. It's like has. wading through treacle, yeah. Yeah, and we, and we, but, but the... You did nothing about sectoral bargaining either, to restore sectoral bargaining, which well, would cover non-union workers. So, I mean, we we're used a long to, way. We're, yeah, no, no, we're, I, I, look, I take that and I think, I think that's, I've got I think a, that's a, incredibly mundane intervention to make. I want to know your memories of new labour and trade unions. First of all, though, apparently we're having some problems with the sound because there's some, some, some phones which oh, are no. too close to no, the really? mics. So if I could ask you all to take out your phones and put them on the floor, uh, that would be uh, that would please the sound guys. Um, all of us. Okay. Mick, I want to know if your memories of New Labour and the trade unions, and if it differs from John's. Well, I do concede that they were marginal improvements, and that they were based. They did appeal to well, didn't appeal. They were focused on non-union areas. What we needed, there was strengthening of the ability to, for unions to organise and influence. And st the fundamental stuff that the Wilson government, who wasn't a right winger and other governments put in place, was sectoral bargaining. So in things like agricultural work in, in private engineering, we used to have like an engineering employers federation who negotiated with the engineering unions that would cover 
all the engineering sector in this, when we had one. You remember it, don't yeah. John? I left school and became an engineering worker. I did an apprenticeship in a factory. They were all covered. So even in non-recognised areas, in all sorts of areas of uh, manufacturing, in non-union plants, they never did that because the employers didn't want it to happen. They wanted this uh, sort of veneer of trade union organisation. And the stuff that he put in that he imported from America uh, through these, these uh, arbit binding arbitration panels about getting union recognition are really, really tough and bureaucratic. They don't give us a right to do anything. And they didn't give us any enforceable rights for individual workers. And the P&O dispute is an example of that. When they broke the law on consultation and redundancy, he didn't strengthen any of that stuff. They did it knowing that nobody could take them to task. They had better legal advice than the Labour front bench. And he did do a lot of work on that, Keir. And I always say Keir was really good on uh, P&O. He met with me directly. He met with P&O workers. He met with our officers, as did Louise Haig and the front bench. All of them. And, but it was moral pleading. It's based on, oh, you're horrible. And it was a bit like being on the side of Bambi against a wolf. You know, it's easy to do. But when it comes to a pay dispute or other areas that are more tough, they're hiding. So they came out for that one because that was a real black and white case. You could only be on one side or the other. Having said that, there were loads of Tories on our side as well. Even the Democratic Unionist Party yeah. were, were backing us. So it was an easy case to, to be sympathetic with. But my memory of it was one of disappointment. I was on the shop floor then as a, an RMT rep in a workplace. And stuff like outsourcing, the, exploit, the mass exploitation of black people in the workplace through outsourcing was not ended. Compulsory competitive tendering in the councils wasn't even challenged. In fact, you relished it. It was challenged. Well, it, was it, it wasn't diluted in any way. It's the norm. Outsourcing now is rampant in this society, which is wrecking working class communities because they're all working for these dreadful people like Mighty and ISS, which have been promoted by a political consensus in the House of Commons that outsourcing and subcontracting is in some way a good thing, which we're seeing in the health service now. People like Milburn were zealots for it. Never trust a trot and never trust an ex-trot even more, in my opinion. They were rampantly in favour of uh, subdividing uh, the big sections of our economy and leaving uh, open to exposure. And the people that have suffered the most are the people in those red wall seats that are working in really insecure report, uh, employment on exploitative wages, usually second or third hand to the corporate entity that is actually making all the money. None of that happened under, under Blair and they relished in not doing it. They said we're the most business friendly community in the, in the developed world and that this, the market in wages is the way it should be. And wages were going down all of the time and not, they relied on under, benefits. Not under new labor. They relied on benefits to equalize that, which subsidized poor employers. That was my memory. I was off about my memory of it, John. Yeah. The fact, we'll do some the fact, fact checking that, later. Yeah, well, yeah. It's <coughs> false, false memory. We'll save the fact false checking memory. later. I feel like this... memories. The workers in, my, in, my, in our industry, even in transport, that are subcontracted, were subcontracted before Labour came in and they were subcontracted after Labour cleared off. Nothing changed for those low-paid workers. I, I want to move on from the, the record of, of Labour's last government and talk about the relationship between Labour Party and, and trade unions again. We sort of discussed, do Labour Party MPs turn up to pickets? How will Labour govern? There is also an influence that the trade unions can directly have over the Labour Party. If they affiliate, they can go to conference, they can put forward motions, they've got seats on the NEC. RMT is one of the trade unions that isn't affiliated to, to the Labour mm. Party. Do you want to explain that decision? Why, why aren't you affiliated well, to the Labour Party? Well, it's because of that dissatisfaction with what the Blair government was doing. Uh, it was a dissatisfaction with that small war that uh, occurred during that period. Uh, they were not keen on strikes, but they didn't mind a few airstrikes, as I remember it. That's one of my memories, uh, that horrible situation they put, put us in. And it was untenable for many socialists to continue on that basis when they wouldn't do anything, uh, in our opinion at the time, to show, express solidarity with what the trade unions were going through. They didn't renationalise the railway, which is what was in the manifesto, a publicly owned, uh, publicly controlled railway. They didn't do it. So we were extremely disappointed and we couldn't continue in that relationship. And they expelled us because we wanted to support some other socialists uh, who were standing in elections at the time. And the relationship came to an end. I mean, it's not worth going through all the detail, but it was untenable given the position our union was in, where we felt absolutely screwed 
by what was going on in the, rail, in the railways in particular, but also the maritime section of, of our industry, which has been absolutely destroyed in this country through successive governments, Tory and Labour, and not a finger has been lifted to save the maritime industry. We've got no regulation of the offshore uh, industry under Labour governments uh, in favour of workers. A whole load of stuff that didn't happen. It's a history of things that didn't happen. And when you're watching Tony Blair sucking up to every employer and every oligarch such as Murdoch, it's very difficult to take when you're sitting on a night shift in a railway yard watching all this go on and nothing is coming in the way uh, of, the, of the RMT at that time, which was the union that founded the Labour Party, ironically, uh, put the first resolution to get a Labour, uh, properly organised Labour uh, Party in Parliament. And then we find ourselves absolutely ostracised because our leader at the time, Bob Crow, was standing up for traditional Labour Party values. And that's the thing that I dislike. The stuff that I believe in, like council housing, uh, municipal socialism and all that kind of stuff, which is reformist and gradualist, it doesn't seem to be on the agenda of anyone. I don't hear anyone in the Labour Party saying, we're going to build 200,000 council houses a year. It doesn't matter how it's going to get done. You just say it's going to get done. That was Attlee's attitude. That was even Macmillan's attitude. That was uh, um, Heath and Callaghan's attitude. They were getting things done on behalf of working people. We're just not hearing that now. And we didn't hear it from Blair either. Final question before we go to the audience. Zara, um, I imagine sometimes you feel a little bit isolated Just in the bit. Labour Party. Would, would you be pleading to, to Mick Lynch to say, why don't, you, why don't you affiliate to the party or maybe have a couple more votes on the di NEC? It's, it's a difficult case to make, given what Mick has just said. And I think that the Labour Party has to be a place where RMT members feel like their interests are being represented because at the end of the day, it comes down to the members as well. So at this moment in time, I can understand why the RMT wouldn't affiliate, but I hope in the future that that will be something that they will do. Um, and it's the job of Labour members and Labour MPs and Labour activists to push the party in that direction. Um, let's open up to the audience. As I said, try and keep them questions, not comments, and also related to the discussion we've just been having. I think there's a roaming mic. Is there a roaming mic? If you're a roaming mic, speak up. <laughs> yeah, if you are a roaming mic, do tell us. Uh, anyway, does anyone have any um, uh, any yeah, questions? There it is. There it is. Yeah. Perfect. The roaming mic will, will come to you. <laughs> oh, I've, I've just been asked, can I get you to stand up, please? I guess specifically for Mick. Um, you've talked a lot about um, how benefits can subsidise low paid and insecure work. Um, and I was wondering how you view um, how unions and the industrial and I guess the party political wings of the Labour Party can support people who subsist only on benefits, um, particularly those who have care for children or adults or who are locked out of work due to disability or other reasons. So yeah, I just wanted to hear about your view on that. Well, I'd like to see a world where nobody is in employment has to live on benefits. It's, when you're doing that, you're subsidising low pay and rapacious employers. So that's, that's the first principle. And it's an absolute principle that the welfare state was founded on, that we should try and make a situation where work pays for itself. And what the employers are getting now is subsidy. They're getting subsidised to pay the lowest wages they can pay. And that's a ridiculous situation. If we ended that, that the employers were actually paying the full price of labour, you haven't got to be a Marxist to work that little conundrum out, you should pay the full price of the labour that you're charging because you're charging somebody for the product or service that you're, you, is your output. That shouldn't be subsidised by the state in the way that it is now. And I'm not talking about infrastructural subsidy or economic subsidy for running a sector. I'm talking about wages are being subsidised. That is absolutely outrageous. And I don't see any uh, move against that. And if we did that, we'd have less welfare expenditure and we could concentrate the money on the people that have severe impairments or have gone past their time at work and in retirement and start linking those things, as many advanced economies do, to some measure of average wages or, or median wages in the economy. So you've got to make the employers pay the full price of labour and then there'll be more money to spend on the welfare state and to spend it more effectively. 
That's what the ambition has got to be. But the employers are getting away with murder at the minute. Um, we got more questions? Yep, there's someone over here. Um, yeah, my question to the panel and to Novara Media. Um, don't you think the whole question of trying to pressure Keir Starmer to support strikes and support the working class is bankrupt and is a dead end? He's a proven servant of the, of the capitalist ruling class and of the crown. And uh, that's his whole program to become prime minister. So what good would it do if, if he were to support strikes? Um, what's needed for the working class and the trade union movement is a general offensive against the whole uh, capitalist ruling class of the country. But I put it to the members of the panel and to Novara Media that um, you're not willing to stand up and organize such an offensive because when the Queen died, every one of you rolled over, gave condolences to the Queen, cancelled strikes, sang the praises of the Queen on Novara Media, and <laughs> I'm, I'm not sure we did that. But the I think we got the question now. I think we got the question. The um, I, I want to go to. I think we 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 we've got the gist. Um, I want to know about this, this the the cancelling the strike because of the Queen. I think that'll be interesting. Zara, I want to know from you though. Is pressuring Keir Starmer a waste of time? No, he's the leader of the Labour Party and the Labour Party is an important vehicle for social change. We want a Labour Party in government. That means the leader also obviously has a lot of influence. So pressurising is important. Um, and I think it's not something that you can just say is a pointless act. There have been decisions that the Labour front bench have you turned on just as um, examples. There's civil liberties legislation that the Tories were going to push through and the Labour Party was going to abstain on. That was a front bench position on spy cops and, um, and, uh, and other pieces of really horrible legislation like that and pressurising works. Um, I'm not saying that is our only strategy. That would be stupid. You need to have different um, things happening at the same time. But as someone who's the leader of, you know, a, a major political party, a party that is seeking government, you absolutely have to be engaging with that process. I actually also want uh, to ask you a question about the Queen, which is we heard a lot about pressure from the leadership to just not tweet anything yeah. um, in, in the days of national mourning. So not, n we're not talking about here tweeting the Queen is... the Queen was it's best to just be quiet. That's just a straightforward... You know, you don't want to go around just provoking people for the sake of... I mean, sorry, Zara. No, well, I mean, Zara, did, yeah, you, yeah. did you feel uh, constrained? I'll did take you feel Mick too answer. Uh, <laughs> Yes. Um, I'm, I'm not uh, ashamed to say I'm a Republican um, and I felt, not just as an MP, but I felt anyone on, on social media, anyone couldn't really express anything um, during those periods of mourning just because that's what the political discourse was. And I think, you know, people talk about freedom of speech, but there are moments where things happen nationally and you can't say things and you just have to sit quiet and just wait for moments to pass. And that is the reality of the situation. It's discreet, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. Well, I suppose, yeah, did you talk about why the RMT made that decision to cancel that well, strike. we do it for a number of reasons. One, many of it, I mean, I spoke tonight at a previous meeting to this, and I said we've got to move the whole working class. There are many people in our working class communities that are socially conservative, that come from religious backgrounds, are new to the country, or just don't dig everything that people in here might dig. We've got to move the whole working class forward together. So we need to go into mosques, we need to go into temples, synagogues, churches. We need to reach into those places. All those people used to uh, vote Labour. My parents were observant, strict Roman Catholic people from Ireland. My dad was also a militant shop steward. The two things are not uh, different, you know, and we need to move everyone forward together. So we cancelled the strikes because many of our members would want to do that. I'm a Republican. I come from a very Republican background, as it happens, not just in the technical sense, but in the sense that you'd say in Ireland. But I understand that people want to uh, show their respects to the Queen. Isn't, I don't see a problem in that. That's the society in which I live. I don't just go around poking people in the eye because <laughs> I think it's funny. What's the point of that? Many of my members who work on the railway might have come from military backgrounds, for instance. It's, it's always, there's always been a connection between that that environment and coming onto the railway because it's a regimented and strict, uh, you know, yeah. rule-based uh, industry. I don't want to go around upsetting our people and our people absolutely supported it. Just be discreet. 
keep quiet for a couple of weeks about these issues. And this stuff that was said, I mean, this is why, I, I mean, I'm, I've never been in a faction in, in politically. I, I hate these newspapers that people brandish. I just think they turn everyone off politics. Uh, the socialism in this country is not going to be won by an ideology-based uh, party. It's going to be won through pragmatic reform of our system. Some of that should be as bold as it can be, and I think there's a, a massive class element to it. But stuff like that is just going to turn everyone off. That's why the unions need to be in the lead for a period, showing that it's working people, real people, real men and women around this country that want change. And the final bit, I'll let you in, John, sorry. No, everyone has to push Keir Starmer, and he expects it. So John's uh, groups and factions, they're going to be prodding Keir, saying, don't do that, don't yeah. give in, or go that way. That's what democracy is. We've, always, we've all got to push him and the front bench and the policy makers. That's what it's all about. That's why we're at this conference, so that we can all have an input into prodding him like a cork on the sea <laughs> in the direction that we want him to go. But we so won't we, all win. We can't. Talking of prodding, John, I mean, uh, just, I just want to interrupt briefly because I think it's interesting. Uh, Mick saying you'll be prodding him from the right. Oh, how, where do you want Keir Starmer to be more right wing? <laughs> where, where, where hasn't he achieved it already? Uh, well... I'm not on the right of the party, so it's a question. You said at the beginning he's not on your wing. You're, you're to the right of Keir Starmer. No, I'm a Blairite. I'm not right wing. Okay. It's completely different. How more Blairite? What should he do that's more Blairite? Uh, I'd love our party to be, to, be to, com to be much more committed to competitive markets, to be absolutely honest. Um, I don't like it when we hear the front bench saying they want, they're want they a pro-business party. We're not a pro-business party. We're a pro-competitive markets party because the market sorts out which is the best business. We shouldn't be saying we're just pro-business because that just makes you clientless to business. Um, but I was going to, what I wanted to say was I agree with a lot of what, um, what Mick was saying. Um, to go two things, I've got the, 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 the questionnaire um, has probably got the wrong view of the Labour Party because the Labour Party has never been a revolutionary socialist party. It never will be. It's a Labour Party. It's not a, it's not a socialist party. It's a Labour Party. We're Labourist, and I'm a defender of Labourism and all that Labourism brings with it, which does bring pragmatism and gradualism, and it brings uh, frustration sometimes for the left of the party, uh, but it brings an energy on the left of the party and ideas on the left of the party that the rest of the party need to engage with and turn into pragmatic and practical solutions that may not go as far as the, as the left want to go, but actually change the country for, 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 for the best. And I think this question about what, we, what, what have we seen? We've seen in recent years um, that Queen Elizabeth II and King Charles III are massively preferable to President Trump. You know, the choice is between actual presidents and actual constitutional monarchs. The constitutional monarchy puts parliament in charge, which I'm pretty happy with. Um, what I'm not happy with with this government is they think that the government should be in charge, not the not parliament. Parliament should be more powerful than the government. And the issue about, um, you know, I come from an Irish family too. My, my, um, uh, I made my application for Irish citizenship and I was going through the birth certificates. Uh, my family, from, I moved to, from Ireland to Paddington. They worked on GWR. They all lived around Paddington for ages because they worked on GWR. Um, but I, I don't think that President De Valera was a great gift to Ireland. Um, and I don't think a president is a solution. I don't think a republic is a solution. I think you have to actually identify a problem. We have a, we have a solution in the UK, which is constitutional monarchy, which is the supremacy of parliament. If there are problems with that, then you have other balances for that. But I don't think the president introducing somebody with a completely different political mandate Sinn is a solution to anything. Sinn Féin used to believe in an Irish monarchy. Sorry? Sinn Féin used to believe in an Irish monarchy before 1960. So like, um, You'd have been on like, that like wing of Sinn Féin, like John. Uh, I was on... Um, my grandfather uh, came to London in the 20s. Yeah. I kind of wish we did a, abolish the monarchy. No, I think that would have been very interesting. Uh, have we got any more any more questions? I think we're going to take it's one more. It's more, yeah. Uh, mm. Which is, do you think there'll be resistance within the Labour Party if Keir Starmer just rolls over and accepts Liz Truss's proposed anti-union legislation without a fuss? I think there's a huge fight uh, to be had and I don't think it will just be the traditional left voices that you might expect. There's loads of people within the Parliamentary Labour Party that have union background that wouldn't accept just kind of accepting that Tory legislation and I think the pressure will come from Labour Party members, I think it will come from the trade union movement and I come think... From me. Exactly, John as well, so I think there's a big fight to be had so it would not be a wise decision. He won't, he won't, I don't think you'd want to just 
roll over. I mean, why would he? Why would anyone, any Democrat? Give any but bit of... Quasi you wouldn't quasi. concede that. I mean, you wouldn't concede the disarmament <laughs> of the biggest democratic organisation in the country. I mean, they're going to say to the Royal College of Nursing, you can't have a ballot on the basis that you had it last week. <laughs> the BMA is coming in. These, these are non-TUC organisations. They want to have All a ballot. the teaching unions. Exactly. And it's an expression of freedom, isn't it, that you can withdraw your labour. They're trying to make that impossible. So, you know, it's part of what we do. He's, I know he's been told very directly tonight at a Chulo meeting where people stand. I saw Dave Ward and Mick Whelan earlier. They're going to, you know, they will have been prodding him very directly and very robustly, which is what this democracy is about, isn't it? It doesn't mean he's going to do everything that they say, but he certainly wouldn't get away with just saying, oh, brush it through and we'll vote against formally. Or abstain. Yeah, he's not going to, I don't think he's going to do that. If he does, he's got a lot of problems. Eh? <laughs> I think we're going to wrap up there because we are running out of time. So thank you so much. Um, to my panel. It's been an excellent discussion. Mick Lynch, John McTernan and Zara Sultana. Can we get a round of applause for the panel, please? Okay. For now, good night. <laughs>